is Asia, where human civilization was born and nurtured. Despite the natural obstacles of mountains, deserts, forests and seas, commercial and cultural exchanges have flourished across the continent's vast expanse. China is bounded by the Pacific Ocean to the east and the Himalayas to the west. Yet these natural barriers have never impeded China's contacts with other Asian civilizations. Dunhuang, an oasis among the mountains and desert of western China. Its position as a major hub on the Silk Road gave rise to a unique local culture bred from interaction among the cultures of China, India, and Central and West Asia. To the east of Mingsha, the Singing Dunes, lie the Mogao Caves, a repository of Buddhist art. The stunning murals and statues here were created over the course of a thousand years, beginning in the 4th century AD. Their craftsmen, originating from India, Arabia, Persia and elsewhere, combined styles from across Asia and the Mediterranean. Celestial figures are a common theme here. The beautiful dancers and hovering musicians are known in China as flying apsaras. They use their celestial robes, not wings, to fly. Such was the creativity of these ancient Asian artists. In Indian Buddhism, apsaras were spirits of song and dance. In India and Afghanistan, most apsaras are depicted as male. The early apsaras found in the Mogao caves are men with high bridged noses and curly hair obvious Indian features. But from the Tang Dynasty on, Chinese artists began to depict them as beautiful women. Although not native to China, Apsaras became an enduring part of the local culture. Silk Road. Not only silk, but also tea, porcelain, and lacquerware flowed from east to west. While black pepper, flax, grapes, and pomegranates headed in the opposite direction. Also, knowledge, technologies, medicine, religions, and philosophies entered China from West, Central, and South Asia. The Chinese, used to sitting on the ground, adopted chairs. They also got a taste for naan bread. The nang, popular in northwest China today, has maintained the name and appearance of the Persian original, 
while in China's interior, it evolved into a smaller version, the Xiaobing. For 2,000 years, the ancient Silk Road, by land and by sea, linked the civilizations of Egypt, Babylon, India, and China. It connected Buddhists, Christians, and Muslims, as well as people of different races. As a main channel of dialogue among civilizations, its camel bells, horses' hooves, and creaking masts marked the progress of human civilization and signaled the coming of opportunity. A Chinese saying goes, stones from other hills may serve to polish jade. Throughout the millennia, China has been enriched thanks to its willingness to learn from other civilizations and absorb their strengths. Sugarcane was first refined in ancient India, where the skill was mastered as early as 2,500 years ago. In English, German, French, Russian, and many other languages, the word for sugar has its origin in Sanskrit. Yet the local Hindi word for sugar is chini, meaning China. The story behind this linguistic peculiarity is one of mutual learning between civilizations. When Tang Dynasty China learned that India was refining sugarcane, they sent an envoy across the Himalayas to obtain the new technology. Records tell us that several Indian craftsmen came to China. The Taizong Emperor ordered that sugarcane be fetched from Yangzhou, and using the newly acquired knowledge, refined sugar was produced in China. Sugar at the time of the Tang Dynasty was known as Sha Gu Ling, which came from Sanskrit. The Chinese perfected the original Indian recipe, creating sugar that was finer and whiter. When the improved technique was transferred back to India, it was widely adopted there, and the product was named for its new place of origin. In the great melting pot of civilizations, there is no higher or lower, first or last, only a common upwards advance that's driven by exchange and mutual learning. Chinese silk and Persian craftsmanship came together to make beautiful silk rugs, while a Persian blue pigment and Chinese clay were used to create classic pottery styles. The Chinese ceramics found in an ancient shipwreck reflect classic Western and Central Asian influences in their styles. The Chinese, when they first saw a giraffe from South Asia, thought it was a chilin, 
Later depictions of the mythical beast would resemble a giraffe. All of this became possible thanks to cultural exchange. Samarkand in modern-day Uzbekistan is one of the oldest cities in Central Asia. Here, the skill of making paper from mulberry bark has survived since the 8th century. The techniques closely resemble those used in ancient China's Han Empire. But how did this Chinese craft reach Samarkand? Contemporary Chinese histories provide no explanation. However, Arabic records tell us that among some captured Tang Dynasty soldiers were a number of Chinese papermakers. Arab rule extended across a vast area at the time, reaching far into Europe and across Asia. Under it, papermaking spread from Samarkand to Baghdad, Damascus, and North Africa, where this new, light, cheap, and readily mass-produced writing material quickly gained popularity. In Europe, parchment fell out of use, replaced by what became known as Samarkand paper. Through continuous exchanges, paper making, the compass, gunpowder, printing, and silkworm breeding from China changed the world. Meanwhile, the Chinese imperial examination system was adopted by several East Asian countries and even influenced countries as far away as England and France. Chinese and Japanese historians have produced numerous descriptions of Chang'an's West Market. This painting shows Sogdian, Persian, and Arab traders in the streets of the Tang capital. Chang'an is remembered today as a powerful symbol of cultural exchange. At its height in the Tang Dynasty, some 30,000 foreign businessmen, diplomats, and students lived in the city. It's said that more than 70 countries and regions sent merchants to conduct business in Chang'an, and that the Arab Caliphate alone dispatched some 40 diplomatic missions there. Today, the city is called Xi'an. In a park in the southeast of the city, Japanese tourists flock to a monument commemorating a Tang-era scholar, Abe no Nakamaro. Originally from Japan, he passed the imperial examination and took up a position as a Tang government official. He counted among his acquaintances the famous Chinese poets Li Bai and Wang Wei. Upon his friend's departure from China, Wang Wei lamented, in all the world, what place is so far? 10,000 miles like riding the void. Within a decade of Abe no Nakamaro's death, around 770 AD, the Japanese capital was moved from Nara to Kyoto. Both cities, in their layout, mimicked Chang'an. And both would go on to become major centers of Japanese culture.
The giant wild goose pagoda at Da Tzu En Temple was the tallest structure in the city of Chang'an. Inside this splendid building, the monk, Xuanzang, installed the treasures he had collected during 17 years spent traveling and studying Buddhism in India. He devoted the final two decades of his life to translating Indian Buddhist texts into Chinese. The Great Tang Records on the Western Regions, a contemporary account of Xuanzang's travels, is an important historical reference on a number of countries, including India, Nepal, and Sri Lanka. Still today, after 1,500 years, Xuanzang is widely admired in his home country. He has also become a symbol of cultural exchange between China and India, and is regarded as a trailblazer for those Chinese who wish to study other cultures. When we look at Asia's ancient history, we see that exchange and mutual learning helped create a number of diverse and vibrant civilizations. Six thousand years ago, a bright blue gemstone became so popular across Mesopotamia that it was more highly prized than gold. Ur, built by the Sumerians, is one of the oldest cities ever discovered. Among the artifacts excavated here, the lapis lazuli ornaments are particularly striking. However, lapis lazuli were not mined in the region. Mostly, the gemstones originated in the Kokcha River Valley in northeastern Afghanistan. As early as 5,000 years ago, an overland trade route was moving them across Asia. Lapis lazuli may have been the earliest internationally traded good. Transporting the stones from Central Asia brought several major civilizations closer together. The world's oldest epic poem, the Epic of Gilgamesh, makes several mentions of lapis lazuli. The inner coffin and gold mask found in the tomb of Tutankhamun feature lapis lazuli set in pure gold. In the Kizil Caves in western China, the blue pigment was used in painting the Buddhist murals. After the Lapis Lazuli Road came the Silk Road, the Spice Road, the Tea Road, the Porcelain Road, and the Hyde Road spreading goods across Asia and beyond. Rich resources and highly developed trade encourage cultures to learn from and tolerate one another. Communication among cultures was also encouraged by the spread of religion. Asia gave birth to the world's great religions. Through the competition for souls and moral ascendancy, they left their mark on different civilizations.
Buddhism, having originated in India in the 5th century BC, first made its way southward to Sri Lanka, and then Myanmar, Thailand, Cambodia, and Laos. To the north, it spread across the Pamir Mountains into China, and from there to Korea, Japan, and Vietnam. Perched on a hilltop between two volcanoes in Indonesia is the world's biggest Buddhist temple. The ancient Borobudur contains 55,000 cubic meters of stone, carved with more than 2,600 reliefs. The temple shows that Buddhism wasn't simply transplanted into the region. It was integrated into the local culture. As for the name, one explanation is that Boro comes from a Sanskrit word meaning temple, while Buddha is derived from a Javanese word for mountain, suggesting that two different cultures came together to create this East Asian wonder. As Buddhism spread, so eventually depictions of the Buddha began to appear across Asia. The earliest statues of the Buddha are associated with the conquests of Alexander the Great. In 334 BC, the young Macedonian king began a campaign that would last for 10 years and take him across half of Asia, forging an empire that stretched from the Balkans to the Indus River Valley. His invasion, although it did great harm to Asia's civilizations, established a foundation on which Greek and Asian cultures could interact. The Greek love of sculpture had a deep impact on Gandhara, a city on the Indian subcontinent. It was here, in the first century BC, that the earliest known depictions of the Buddha were created. The Gandhara Buddha sculptures were based on the image of Apollo, the Greek god of the sun. But Gandharan art also incorporated Persian and Indian elements. This unique combination became one of the classic forms of Buddhist art. Human culture is diverse. Mutual learning allows art to transcend time. Sari is one of the world's oldest forms of dress. That the sari is mentioned in the ancient Indian epic Mahabharata tells us that it's been in existence for several millennia. Similar clothes are widely seen throughout South Asia. In today's India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, and Sri Lanka, women still wear the sari. By doing so, they are maintaining the traditional aesthetics and way of life of their ancient civilization. In April every year, countries across Asia celebrate water sprinkling festival, just as they have done for centuries. However, the festival has different traditions associated with it depending on if it's being celebrated in Thailand, Laos, Myanmar, Cambodia, and elsewhere in Southeast Asia, or in China and Sri Lanka. Yet it has one common feature, the use of water as a blessing and means of wishing for good fortune.
The origin of water sprinkling festival dates back to 5th century Persia, where water was sprayed as a form of blessing during winter. The festival later spread to India, where it became known as Songkran, before being adopted in Myanmar, Thailand and China, where it is still celebrated today. From West to South Asia, from Southeast to East Asia, Water Sprinkling Festival has survived and gained vitality through exchange and mutual learning. Three thousand years ago, the Phoenicians who occupied the coastal regions of what is today Lebanon and Syria in West Asia created something that would affect all of humankind. In order to facilitate trade, they refined Egyptian hieroglyphs and Sumerian cuneiform script to create a simplified writing system consisting of 22 letters. This was a historic development. The script would become the source of nearly all the world's alphabets. In Europe, Phoenician script evolved into the Greek and then the Latin and Slavic alphabets, ultimately becoming the basis of all Western writing systems. In Asia, it evolved into the Aramaic alphabet, which was subsequently adapted and used by the Indian, Arab, Hebrew, Persian and other peoples. English, the lingua franca of the modern world, can trace its 26-letter alphabet back to the ancient Phoenicians of Asia. Through exchange and mutual learning among civilizations, the original 22-letter alphabet evolved, branched out, and flourished. In this way, it became the foundation of writing across the world. Through constant exchanges with other regions, Asian civilizations have established their identity and changed the world. In Shakespeare's tragedy Macbeth, Lady Macbeth says, all the perfumes of Araby will not sweeten this little hand. This outburst reveals that as early as the 16th century, Europe's nobility prized spices and fragrances from the Arab world. It was in ancient Egypt that spices were first widely used. Once they reached the Arabian Peninsula, spices quickly became an essential element of the local culture. Historically, the trade in spices and fragrances has been closely associated with the Arab world. The unique natural conditions in the southern part of the Arabian Peninsula made it the only place in the world that produced frankincense and myrrh. The Greek historian Herodotus wrote, the whole of Arabia exhales the most delicious fragrance. Three thousand years ago, after the domestication of the camel, spice roads formed, and a web of trade routes began radiating from the Arabian Peninsula. Records from the 3rd century AD tell us that at the time, 10,000 camels carried spices between the southern Arabian Peninsula 
and the Mediterranean every year. Spices are mentioned a total of 188 times in the Bible, none more so than frankincense and myrrh. It was every European merchant's dream to control one of the spice roads. The great explorers of the Age of Sails, including Christopher Columbus, Vasco da Gama, and Ferdinand Magellan were all spice traders. The trade in spices, precious stones, silk, and pottery brought the rich and fertile Arabian Peninsula into contact with numerous civilizations including Mesopotamia, India, and China in Asia, and Rome and Greece in Europe. This interaction would have a powerful influence on progress and development in the ancient world. Tales such as Ali Baba and the Forty Thieves, Aladdin's Wonderful Lamp, and the Seven Voyages of Sinbad have become part of global popular culture. In the 8th and 9th centuries AD, folk stories such as these were compiled into the classic 1001 Nights or the Arabian Nights. No single author is responsible for this iconic work. Rather, it's a collection of folk tales that were brought together and refined by ordinary people and scholars over several centuries. It contains folk tales from Persia, India, and the Abbasid Caliphate, as well as Greece, Rome, China, and elsewhere. It is now considered a classic of world literature. When it was translated into French by Antoine Galland in the early 18th century, 1001 Nights gave rise to a fascination for the Orient that swept Europe. The work is a fruit of the coming together of people from different regions and cultures. Still today, it continues to be an inspiration for artists around the world. However, during the Middle Ages, Europe lost many Greek and Roman classics. Fortunately, Europe was not alone. In neighboring Asia, Arab scholars had, in the course of two centuries, translated the literature of Greece, Rome, Persia, India, and other civilizations into Arabic. Such was the desire to gather knowledge from other parts of Asia and Europe that enormous resources were devoted to these projects. Translators were offered generous rewards for their work. In 830 AD, the Bayt al-Hikmah, or House of Wisdom, was established in Baghdad as a center for scholars, teachers, and translators. Ptolemy's Almagest, Plato's Republic, Aristotle's Physics, and his works on logic, as well as many other treasures of human civilization, were translated into Arabic during this period. In this way, many great works that might otherwise have been lost were preserved for posterity and could later be retranslated back from Arabic.
in part thanks to the knowledge gained through these translations, a flourishing Arab civilization was created that would have a major influence on the European Renaissance. As Bertrand Russell wrote, contacts between different civilizations have often, in the past, proved to be landmarks in human progress. Civilizations are like water, silently nurturing everything they touch. Looking back on history, we realize that no civilization is perfect, and no civilization has all the answers. But each one is unique, and its achievements are deserving of respect and appreciation. History is our inspiration for our actions today. Only through exchange and mutual learning can we create an inclusive, vibrant society in which everyone can flourish. The light of thought transcends time. The seed of hope gives life to all things. Asia is opening up a new era of sharing and mutual learning for the good of the world and the future.